Hello, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to the first Zare Institute webinar of 2024. Thanks for tuning in today. I'm Erin Bremer, a graduate assistant for the Zare Institute, and I will begin by going over our agenda for today's webinar before I hand things over to our guest host for today, Dr. Jared Drennan. Uh, today's topic is restorative justice in mental health services, engaging with complexity and vulnerability. Dr. Drennan will begin by introducing our guest speakers, sharing a bit about their backgrounds and work. They will then discuss our topic for today. We want to note that everyone will do their best to communicate in a manner so that you viewers can follow along, but please comment in the comment section of whatever platform you're watching from if you have any difficulty with the speed of our guest conversation. Following their discussion, there will be time for our guests to answer questions from you all. Um, I'll hop, hop back on and um, help moderate some of those. Then to wrap up after the Q&A portion, um, I'll share some details about our next webinar. There will be a recording of this webinar posted on both the Zare Institute's website and our YouTube channel by the end of this week if you would like to return to it or share it with others. All right, our guest host for today is Dr. Jared Drennan. Dr. Drennan is a consultant, clinical psychologist, and psychotherapist, and head of psychology and psychotherapy in the Forensic Mental Health Service that is part of South London and Maudsley National Health Service Foundation Trust in London. Um, Jared trained as a psychologist in Cape Town, where he witnessed transitional justice firsthand in South Africa in the 1990s. Jared has worked to introduce restorative justice practices into forensic mental health settings for more than a decade, including leading an implementation project in the National Health Service, doing research and publishing articles, book chapters, and conference papers in the UK, Europe, and North America. Uh, Dr. Drennan has also served as Chair of Trustees of the Restorative Justice Council in the UK. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'm going to hand things over to him now to introduce himself and our guests. Thank you very much for your generous um, introduction, Erin, and um, uh, we're very grateful to the Zare Institute for giving us this opportunity to talk about uh, restorative practice in mental health. And I'm very grateful to not be doing this on my own this afternoon and being joined by, by three colleagues. So first of all, I want to introduce uh, Sarah Cooper, who is a senior forensic psychologist based at Kent and Medway Partnership, NHS Trust in the South of England. In 2016, Sarah introduced restorative practice to a secure forensic mental health service that supports adult men who have a history of offending and high risk behavior. But really importantly, they have additional needs, including intellectual and developmental disabilities, complex trauma and mental health problems. So Sarah undertook research evaluating the implementation project of this group of service users, often excluded, you know, almost traditionally excluded from access to restorative justice and has begun to publish this really groundbreaking work through international conferences and publications. And I'm very grateful that um, Sarah has joined us this afternoon to be able to, to talk about her, to share her work with you. Next is James Tapp, who is a senior lecturer in forensic psychology at the University of Kingston in London. Um, James is also training as a forensic psychologist practitioner in a high security hospital that's part of the NHS, uh, the National Health Service in the UK. And James has worked in high secure mental health settings for almost two decades um, with people who have long term severe mental health needs and have seriously harmed others as well as themselves. And over time, James has published research on rehabilitation in this population and in recent years extended his interests to include the role of restorative justice in these contexts and currently supervising a PhD student in a project looking at the compatibility of theories of restorative justice in forensic mental health contexts and impacts on identities of those taking part. So James is going to be able to expand on on that uh, brief overview of uh, a huge area of work that he's been um, doing for a number of years um, now. And then our final uh, guest for the webinar this afternoon is 
um, my direct colleague, um, Finn Swanepoel. We worked together at South London and Maudsley. Um, but Finn grew up in Zimbabwe and came to restorative work formally um, more than 12 years ago um, when working as a prison chaplain in the UK and now in forensic mental health the past seven years. So Finn is registered as an advanced restorative justice practitioner with the United Kingdom's uh, Restorative Justice Council and in June 2022 became the first and currently only restorative justice practitioner employed in this capacity in, in the UK. And that's very much more of what Finn's going to talk about um, when uh, he, the microphone passes to, to him. Um, Finn is passionate and committed to being restorative with people, with projects and with planning and is working within systems and institutions to enable them to be more restorative. Uh, Finn facilitates rehabilitation programs, promoting restorative thinking in our settings with uh, our patients' families and supporters, as well as being a keen cyclist and is deeply dependent on the wild for inspiration and connection. So um, thank you all uh, for, for joining me this afternoon in order for us to share our experience um, over the past few years with bringing restorative thinking to our, our context. Um, we wanted to start with somebody else who might have been on this call if we hadn't lost Henry Kiernan uh, shortly before Christmas. Um, we wanted to pay tribute in this webinar to Henry, who has been our teacher and mentor in the restorative journey from the very beginning. Henry provided restorative justice conference training to the first cohort of mental health practitioners to undertake training in a forensic mental health service in the county of Sussex in South England uh, more than 12 years ago. Um, Henry went on to train almost every forensic mental health service that has undertaken conference training in England, including Kent and Medway, North London, West London on multiple occasions, and South London and Maudsley. And as I said, Henry would have been here this afternoon had he not fallen ill in the autumn and sadly passed before Christmas. Um, Henry was a restorative parent to us all, and we were blessed to have his wisdom, his kindness and his enthusiasm for the time we did, and we greatly feel his loss. Um, so for us, really, this afternoon is a kind of tribute, really, to, to Henry, that we're only here because of, of what he gifted us, us all. So uh, I'm going to move on from, from that acknowledgement. Um, to uh, and and I don't yet need a, a, a slide. I'll come to the next slide um, in a few moments. But we we wanted to start by um, with the basics, really. What you know? What do we mean by forensic mental health? We we use that term all the time, and it's a familiar one in the UK. But it might not be for those joining from other places of the world. So by forensic mental health, we, we mean a specialist branch of mental health services that provide treatment and risk assessment and uh, uh, risk management to people who not only have mental health difficulties, but who have also committed serious offences. Um, uh, as our introductions have said, we we uh, three of us are, are psychologists, and another uh, uh, Finn is our restorative justice practitioner. Um, but but the clients that we we work with are are people who s sometimes have been transferred from prisons for treatment of their mental health needs. But uh, certainly in in the setting that I and Finn work in most admissions are from other mental health services or or from community settings or or people who are detained at the point of committing an offense and that that word detained is a really important one because all of our patients are detained under the criminal sections of the mental health act so all mental health detentions in the united kingdom are governed under the mental health act um, of parliament and there are criminal sections that specify um, uh, the conditions of their detention and release. And most patients are detained indefinitely um, after a serious offence. 
although that detention ranges from perhaps around two years to sadly, and in some cases, a lifetime. Um, but this term uh, indefinite detention, there is a, an archaic phrase that's used in English law, which refers to the this period of detention as being without limit of time. And that's because our patients are required to demonstrate a reduction in risk and often that falls to us as practitioners to demonstrate that they have recovered sufficiently well in their mental health and also reduced their risk in order to be safe to live again in, in the community. Um, so the majority of the patients in our services are male um, and women accounting for around 10% of our clients. So we have a slide just to show um, the uh, UK map of the distribution of secure services across uh, England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. And as you can see, there's a very large conglomeration, mainly in the south and in the Midlands, and there are fewer services in uh, the less populous parts of the of the UK. There are about uh, seven and a half thousand secure beds across England and Wales, and that's about a third of all mental health beds available in the in the UK. Um, there's about 800 places in three high secure hospitals and about 6,000 or so places in medium and low secure settings. And each of those has different specifications to calibrate them as, as levels of security. Um, Finn, Sarah and I will talk about work in our low and medium secure settings and, and James in his experience in high secure. So as our, our biographies um, refer to, actually all of our patients suffer from serious mental health difficulties. So predominantly that is some form of psychosis, which involves hearing voices and having delusional beliefs and other uh, consequences of psychosis, but also bipolar affective disorder, or what used to be referred to as manic depression. But we also have a number of patients who are detained under what is actually an increasingly controversial term, which is personality disorder and Typically, a large proportion of our patients will meet the criteria for what's referred to as an antisocial personality disorder. And some people will be assessed as well for um, whether they are considered to have features of psychopathy. But also substance misuse and alcohol uh, addictions are, are very high, uh, prominent in our patient group, as well as cognitive and intellectual impairments autism and other neurodevelopmental conditions. So as such, our patients are, are very, very vulnerable people. They have high levels of trauma, their conditions are relapsing and remitting, and they often pose serious risks of harm to themselves. Um, we sometimes understand our patients as suffering from toxic shame. Um, and of course, that's a really significant concept in the restorative world and the role of, of shame in thinking about offending and in restorative intervention. So it's something that we're very mindful of and perhaps we can talk about that um, later. Um, but also our patients suffer from what's called, uh, sometimes referred to as morbid guilt, and that is guilt for things that they didn't do, but where they, they, their guilt is very severe and actually results in their mental health difficulties. It, and in this vulnerable population, evidence-based practice is absolutely imperative. Um, medically evidence-based practice in order to, to practice ethically. And it's one of the real challenges that we have in this population when introducing restorative work is that the evidence base for restorative practice in our settings is really at a beginning and there isn't a substantial or established evidence base. But we know that restorative interventions promote agency and accountability, and that actually fits very well with models of recovery and rehabilitation in forensic services. And so we are always looking for the read across and the, the, the overlapping evidence base in order to land this type of work. Um, I think you will have gathered that our, our patients have committed serious offences, serious violent offences in order to get into our services to meet the threshold. And so that will clearly include homicides, attempted murder, other types of serious assault, also sexual violence and other types of offending like fire setting. Um, but of course, what that means is that, of course, it's not just our 
patient group who are vulnerable, but of course the people they have harmed, whether that is surviving families or uh, also, yeah, thank you for moving the slides on. Um, but also um, the, the 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 people who are in their families. So um, a significant proportion of our patients have committed offences against stranger victims, but actually almost a majority are people in some form of relationship to them. Uh, and often that is family members. And it was interesting to see there's a recent webinar in this series that considered feminist kinship approaches to family violence in thinking restoratively. And we often find ourselves asking whether the intervention needed is a restorative one or a family therapy one. And that may be something that we can discuss as we go on. But also, of course, when our patients are admitted, they don't stop being behaviorally disturbed. And so they commit um, harm towards fellow patients and towards our staff. And a lot of our restorative thinking involves addressing that group. So we, we also very mindful about just how international the audience may be for this afternoon's webinar. And so all of our talks will include some reference to place. And so I wanted to just briefly um, use the next slide to indicate something about where Finn and I work. So we're based at the Bethlehem Royal Hospital, which lays claim to being the oldest psychiatric hospital in the world because it was first established in 1274 in central London. But is now in a much larger uh, facility in uh, in South London. Um, but we also are connected to the, the world-renowned Maudsley Hospital, which is named after a mental health uh, a psychiatrist pioneer, Henry Maudsley. And the next slide shows the, the specific um, secure unit that uh, Finn and I work in, which is uh, a river house on the grounds of the Bethlehem Hospital. So if that slide's available, we'll show that just very briefly. Uh, yeah, there we are. So that's River House, um, uh, in, uh, which has uh, um, a, about 86 beds in the unit and we have nearly 220 beds in, in all. So uh, we can you can stop showing that slide now, thank you. Um, Something really important about acknowledging place is that being based in South London, the majority of our uh, of our client group, our patient group, are actually black or mixed black um, patients. And and what we also know is that in mental health services generally, that our uh, uh, black and mixed black patients are disproportionately detained under the Mental Health Act. And, and we know that the, the, the social determinants of offending that include social exclusion, um, poverty, and other forms of social disadvantage are overrepresented in our client group. And so um, the, uh, the, 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 the multifactorial, the intersecting nature of our client group's vulnerability is also social. And so when thinking about restorative work in our settings, we also are very mindful that we need to attend to institutional and systemic racism. Um, in other words, the social justice aspects of an anti-racist focus in our work is has been growing in prominence and is something that we will touch on as we go through our, our talks this afternoon. So uh, I just wanted to briefly acknowledge that um, thinking about the, the historical development of an interest in restorative um, practice in mental health settings. And, and that is that back in 2003, there was a paper publication by Sharon Garner and Thomas Hofmeister, based not a stone's throw away from um, Eastern Mennonite at the University of Virginia, where they published a paper calling for restorative practice as a, a better means of responding to offenders with mental disorder. And then 10 years later, the same authors published another paper making another plea or a call for applications. But they were writing from a legal point of view, legal practitioners saying this makes sense. But actually what we've seen is very little engagement from the mental health sector itself. Um, and, and I think a lot of misunderstandings and um, misinformation about what restorative practice is 
But a notable exception to that has been a paper by Jason Quinn and Professor Sandy Simpson based in Ontario in 2003. They acknowledged the rise in the, the, the amount of prominence given to the voice of victims in court processes. And what they were highlighting is that if that increased voice is not just going to be retributive or condemning, then dialogue and understanding has to be promoted. And they were advocating very helpfully for us in the adoption of restorative approaches. So a little bit about how we've responded to that. So uh, most restorative justice services in the UK are commissioned by city mayors or police and crime commissioners, but very, very few of the referrals that those commission services receive are for the victims of people who've been harmed by mental health patients or ref self referrals by the mental health patients themselves. And in order to get this going, what we've often done is trained an, an in-house cohort of mental health practitioners in restorative justice conferencing. And, and that for me was transformational I, for the first time, even though I understood theoretically about restorative justice and um, had some idea, it really was the beginning of thinking about how to apply this work. Um, but the critique of that approach is that it's often referred to as being the train and hope model um, of introducing restorative justice. And we have to acknowledge that in mental health services, this is not core business you could say that this was uncalled for. And so as a result of that, what happens is that culture carriers who perhaps have done the training move on from services and then the project comes to an end. And so something we've been very mindful of in our national network here in the UK has been that we are trying to create structural change in order for this work to have greater longevity than um, just being practitioner based. So one of the things that we will highlight this afternoon is finding that in order for this restorative work to take root in mental health settings, we have to find ways in which restorative practice solves problems for the health organisation. And because then they have an interest, they've got some skin in the game, as it were. And we, we each of us will talk about the way in which uh, restorative practice has addressed some form of mental health challenge within the organisation. So those were the preliminary remarks that I wanted to make about our setting and about how this, this work has begun. And uh, I want to hand over now to James to pick up the thread and to talk about how this has landed in the particular setting in which James's experience um, comes from. Thanks, James. Thanks very much, Gerard. Um, yes, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for dialing in and listening and, and people who pick this up later down the line. Um, just to uh, follow on from Gerard's point around uh, place, I guess I'm uh, presenting from um, one of those areas of forensic mental health practice, which, which is from a high security sort of context. I can see people in the chat actually are from Canada and Finland and America. So uh, maybe I can link with some of the sort of relevance of hospital settings. Um, so. I'm, I'm sort of speaking really just from my own experiences as someone who, as, who's a part of a really large group, so sort of representing just my views of how restorative justice has come into the setting. So I think I might just maybe helpfully talk a bit about that setting and its origins, um, if it's possible to share the first slide. Thank you. So I, I was sort of, I took the, the sort of focus of being about roots and, and how roots are embedded, um, just thinking that restorative justice is uh, regularly referred to as a grassroots sort of movement. So the roots of the high security uh, hospital, mental health hospital settings in the UK. Um, the hospital I'm sort of speaking to you from can be located in the southeast of England. And the origins for that, Gerald sort of covered around a, a place where people have gone to, um, to be, have been detained in those places um, in relation to sort of acts of harm that they've uh, been involved in. 
or responsible for. And the purpose of the settings has been to sort of restore the mental health of that person and, and their well-being and, and also reduce that risk so they're able to move on from this setting. So the origins of uh, where I'm speaking from today, which is Broadmoor Hospital, which is one of the few high security hospitals in the country, um, just to present this, these roots go back a very long time, back as far back as 1863, just connecting with people in the room, um, thinking from America, I think the equivalent might be somewhere like a Tascadero state or in Canada, somewhere like Waypoint or in Finland, um, near Niemi Hospital, uh, are examples maybe where there's, where there's parallels in terms of maximum security provision. So th th that's the original roots, really, of, of the hospital I'm, I'm coming from, where I suppose back when they were introduced, the focus was on was on mental health recovery and, and risk reduction for people admitted to them. The reason for, for explaining that, I think, just to move on to the next slide, is, is given those um, sort of early roots in their provision was to think about how that over time they've been established and, and sort of providing you some pictures of, of our new hospitals. So the original ones being of the gatehouse in, in the service, but we've moved into a new uh, development, a new redeveloped uh, hospital in the last few years and a sort of just to acknowledge, I guess, that over that long period of time, a service um, such as a forensic mental health service in, has very, very established roots in terms of the practices and, and provision. So, as mentioned, I, I kind of, it was nice to be invited to take part in the talk. And, and actually, there are people in the room who've been more involved than I have in, in establishing restorative justice. But I just thought my observations from, and from doing this kind of work with a a patient group or a group of people um, who require that level of care is how how restorative justice overlaps with some of some of the purposes and, and the gaps in it. So I was I was reviewing um, another webinar for the Zaire Institute, thinking about opportunities to embed restorative just, justice. Uh, and and one thing that struck me was about finding the gaps in places in which to do that and in organizations. So just to think about the established roots of the places of these, these types of hospitals, um, currently this is, these are sort of the, the roots of those systems are around the principles that we have around care and values for, for the provision of, of what's, what's offered to people who are admitted. So that's, that's very patient-centered, really thinking about recovery as a focus. So how, how do we restore people to a point where they can leave and move on? Um, there are th it's driven by therapeutic activities within the environment and we work with a whole host of professions um, to achieve that task. And I suppose the, the connectedness to the outside is around carer uh, involvement as well. So links, and, and as Jared had mentioned, some of those links might be, be relevant to the context of harm that's happened. So uh, I suppose the principle of what we provide is, is about including people from the outside in, in, into the kind of journey of patients here. And then within the services, in terms of how we achieve those, those sort of principles of care, there's a whole host of areas that I'll, I'll mention in a moment that where I think restorative justice, or I've certainly seen it become a part of, of these actions within, within the provision. So there's things that we do around staff training, assessing the needs of, of patients and providing treatments for them to reduce that risk and, and hopefully recover their mental health to be able to move on. Um, workplace culture is obviously key and a fundamental to that. And the, within the setting, in terms of, uh, I suppose there's uh, three areas of ways in which we provide um, that sort of care, which is around the physical nature of the environment, as well as the kind of policies and how we work at a relational level with understanding the needs of the people within the services, as well as their connections with people outside. And then I suppose the outcomes which I've already measured, uh, sorry, already mentioned, which is around um, improving mental health, the person's quality of life, reducing their risk moving forward, and the idea of social reintegration. So, so reconnecting someone with, with their, the world outside. I think I've, I've included sort of, I guess that's the function of a high school service uh, very, very broadly. And then the thing that I certainly I think I've experienced from having um, conducted or been involved in restorative justice referrals um, and observing and witnessing how it's become part of the system in which I work. So I think um, I've borrowed uh, Michael Hartman's kind of uh, model of implementing restorative justice as a guide just to think about 
where did these things come together? Where might they overlap? Where might they, they be complementary? Uh, and also where there's areas to, to, I suppose, where there's areas where there might be challenge in embedding them. So th this was really just my reflections on that process, which would be good to sort of uh, maybe discuss afterwards to see what um, if other people have similar experiences. I'm just noting certainly from reading how it's implemented in other institutions like schools and in prisons, that there are certainly some parallels. So I suppose fundamentally at the roots level, um, there's a, I think there's a very clear overlap in terms of restorative justice values and the principles of care within a context um, of this hospital where I am. So there's something around the connectedness of relationships, thinking including about um, external ones and internal ones, our relational connection with patients, something around uh, empowering patients and other people within those settings to, to be able to build relationships with one another um, and respecting that uh, 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 grassroots level among all those involved in the, in the, the care that's received and the provision of it. Uh, thinking around the internal processes is how might we sort of have leadership that role models restorative justice values and I think that's been the case within the services that there has been a clear um, provision of support uh, in providing and embedding restorative justice and that can come across staff training so processes where staff have been trained in informal restorative justice processes as a way of engaging and working with patients um, as well as providing restorative justice practitioners within the setting. So that's been something that's that's been included and, and allowed for a workforce of a restorative justice practitioners to, um, to, to, I suppose, start to build on those those grassroots or start to, to work on, on making a provision where there can be scope to repair harm in addition to those other actions that are provided um, within the service. I think an area where, again, using a, this model that's come from more juvenile justice is around outward connections and, and the interface between partners in the community and um, and including uh, victims and their voices. And I, I think, again, another reflection is that historically that's perhaps not been the focus as much as it has restoring the well-being of patients admitted and reducing risk. And I think what restorative justice brings is an opportunity to think a bit more around how we might include the voices of people outside of a setting um, a bit more in, in, in terms of how we might move forward in repairing relationships and I guess thinking more longer term in terms of the social reintegration. So I've had the opportunity to be involved in, in restorative pieces of work that have been connecting between people in the community and patients who are within the setting um, and I think it's just an area for further development might be thinking about how to how to foster that even more. Um, as I mentioned, there are some sort of, I don't know, I've experienced some or sort of observed some interesting processes where restorative justice uh, sort of terminology and policies have started to grow within within the service in which I'm based, um, which makes it feel like it's, it's sort of beginning to be embedded and, and and expand as it moves on. Um, but some reflections have certainly been the, the, the how that how that works together. Um, in, and in, or equally, in some ways, uh, I think how the, the language can be challenging in adapting it to think about how restorative justice uh, yeah, language is embedded within a, a very deeper rooted sort of set of um, ideas and practices. And, and, and that's, as I say, sort of a piece of work that seems to be ongoing. Um, so yes, that's uh, that's the sort of initial reflections really and, and observations from from that uh, embedment embedding of restorative justice into into this this type of setting. Uh, so I think at that point I will hand over to Sarah. Thank you, James. Um, Thank you, Gerard, for the introduction earlier. Um, hi, everyone. It's really great to be here today. Um, so I'm going to start by sharing with you a little bit about the setting in which I work. Um, I work in a low secure forensic unit in Kent in the southeast of England. Um, Kent is a largely white population and as such, the majority of our patients are white. 
um, and being on the border of South East London, which has a much more ethnically diverse population, a large proportion of the staff team is black and from other ethnic minority backgrounds. Um, and I'm sharing that with you as this is something that we'll, I'll come back to later. Um, I work across the Brookfield Centre, which is a 13 bed locked rehabilitation unit, um, and the Tarrant Fort Centre, which is a 20 bed low secure unit. Um, all patients are male and they present with a wide range of issues, including intellectual disabilities and developmental disorders. Um, this is often with additional mental health issues such as personality difficulties and complex trauma. Um, it's the fit between intellectual disabilities and other developmental disorders such as autism um, with restorative practice that I'm going to sort of look into today. Um, so restorative practice was first set up in the service in response to incidents where patients had caused harm to members of the team or to other patients. Um, and Jared sort of already mentioned earlier a little about the types of harms that are experienced in our services and the impact that this can have. Um, to engage in restorative processes, participants need to be able to understand, remember and communicate their story. Uh, they need an understanding of theirs and others' emotions and an ability to self-regulate and problem solve um, to sit within a conference setting. Living with an intellectual disability or autism um, will result in there being difficulties in achieving some of these requirements. Um, as a facilitator, I see it as my role to know and understand the needs of participants, to see how such issues may impact on restorative processes um, and ensure work is adapted to meet the needs of all parties where it's safe to do so. So here preparation is key and it may be that the preparation stage takes a lot longer than perhaps in other cases. Um, sorry, not quite at this slide yet. Um, there we go. Um, so yeah, so it might take a bit longer to, to get to that stage. So um, there are some initial adaptions that you can do to, um, I guess, sort of help that process. So that would include things such as adapting language to take out jargon, uh, using simple terminology and avoiding metaphors, um, using aids to help participants recall events, um, so social stories and comic strips have been really useful in um, helping patients connect sequence of events when thinking about an incident and also then connecting both their emotions and thoughts about that incident. Um, spending time rehearsing what will be explored in the conference and I guess because of the structured dialogue that's inherent in restorative conferencing that lends itself quite well to, to working with some of our patients. Um, with regard to empathy, uh, spending time identifying, labelling and understanding an individual's own response um, and how this might be different to other people's experiences. Also creating a space to sit and learn to, learn to sit with and process difficult emotions, minimising the risk of individuals becoming overwhelmed in a conference and I guess particularly when thinking about feelings of shame where that could become, uh, present itself in quite challenging ways. Um, additional uh, ways to help would be are, are things that would be done anyway around agreeing rules for engagement um, and thinking about having maybe more breaks in a meeting, checking in with individuals um, and making sure the conference is paced at the needs of the individual. And I guess also where consent has been provided, supporting other participants to understand the needs of those in the conference, such as the limits of their social and emotional capabilities and how this might impact on their engagement. So these strategies were an encouraging start when we um, and enabled some of our patients to successfully engage with restorative conferences when we first introduced it to the service. Um, and where we did uh, facilitate conferences, outcomes were very positive with high levels of satisfaction. We observed change was happening uh, without formal conferencing as patients reflected more greatly on their behaviour and learnt new ways to manage themselves. Um, those harms felt validated and they, they were reported improvements in the therapeutic relationship. However, not all referrals were assessed as suitable for a conference, and we found this most frequently on our acute unit, where there was a higher rate of incidents. Difficulties with emotional regulation, taking responsibility and motivation, prevented restorative work from going forward. So I reflected on this further on what we could do to support these patients to engage and to ensure that everyone had the opportunity to benefit from restorative practice. So this led to the development of a restorative ward and is very much built on Sydney Decker's goals for restorative justice. 
Um, the focus needed to extend from not only responding to incidents of harm, but also to promoting a safe and supportive ward in anticipation of these events. I wanted to find a way to work with an already, already stigmatised group that promoted inclusion and a sense of belonging, um, recognising that many of our patients had limited experiences and opportunities to engage in meaningful restorative dialogue. Um, home life has often been troubled and full of trauma, with few opportunities to experience and develop skills in building and maintaining healthy relationships. So the aim was to create an environment which fostered awareness, empathy and responsibility, where informal restorative practices became a part of everyday life. So the model is set into three tiers, each level feeding into the next. Um, I trained all the staff from the wards, all of our nurses and healthcare workers um, and members of the wider MDT as well um, in informal restorative practices um, and then offer fortnightly supervision where we can develop skills further and reflect on practice. So the first tier moral engagement provides opportunities where patients are supported to engage in processes that enable them to reflect on their behaviour in a meaningful way and build connections. The approach humanises and validates those who've been harmed and promotes a culture um, which encourages ownership of behaviour. So some of the ways we've achieved this is through the use of effective statements, so letting a person know how we feel and how we're affected by their actions without judgement and separating the behaviour from the person. And I guess for those that struggle to identify and label feelings, it offers an opportunity from them to hear from others the impact of their behaviour and what's needed from them. We introduced restorative circles, um, sort of facilitated in the mornings, and they provided an opportunity to enhance communication and build a sense of community. They helped break down barriers and build connections and develop peer support. Um, they provided opportunities to hear patient voices and to tune into their thinking and responses. Um, and they also supported in the development of empathy, allowing patients to see others held different views to their own um, in fun and non-confrontational ways and provided opportunities to develop de de decision making and problem solving skills. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, restorative practices were built into patient care plans and positive behaviour support plans, ensuring safe and consistent practices were aligned with the individual needs of the patient. And we're also working towards making our ward rounds, the sort of fortnightly meetings we have about our patients, and additional review meetings more restorative by considering the language we use and aligning it with McCold and Watchtools working with principal from their social discipline window. The second tier, emotional processing, supports patients to consider in a safe and non-judgmental manner the impact of their behaviour, developing victim empathy and supports de the development of social problems, uh, social problem solving skills. Um, for the person harmed, opportunities are provided for a space to feel and be empowered and they can express to the harmer the true impact of their actions and ask questions. So restorative questions and conversations offered structure to difficult conversations, helping individuals understand where harm had occurred, the impact it had and what could be done to make amends. Um, I guess these were discussions that staff were already having with patients, but I guess it was about reframing it um, using those restorative questions, which proved incredibly helpful. Um, and we found that that encouraged uh, increased responsibility and greater reflection. Um, we then use circles uh, to begin to explore different types of harm um, and this provided opportunities for individuals to reflect on their behaviour um, and perhaps influencing their future actions as they considered the impact of their behaviour through their own and other shared experiences from those discussions. And space was equally provided for individuals to voice where they'd been harmed um, and have their experiences heard and validated by peers. Um, we've also thought about using restorative principles within the group work we do, um, incorporating those principles. So one example is where I've developed a, a few years ago an active ally group. So we've run that group twice and I'll come a bit more, talk a bit more about that later on. Um, and then the third tier is around reintegration. And I guess that's where we're looking at the conferences, which is, I guess, where I started. <coughs> Excuse me. So after trialling this way of working for six months, outcomes revealed improvements approaching statistical significance in measurements of therapeutic hold, um, patient cohesion and experience safety, as well as a reduction in harms that were experienced on the ward. And there may, of course, be other reasons that impacted on those findings. 
Um, restorative circles help build connections between staff and patients. They created a forum where trust could be developed, facilitated a way for patients to explore their feelings and hear how others thought differently to them. With regard to challenges, the capacity to deliver restorative working was sensitive to changing dynamics within the service, including organisational changes with, which led to a diluted approach. Patients moving across wards change the dynamics of the circles and that often meant that we then had to reset to build, rebuild those in connections and that feeling of safety. Um, momentum was sensitive to staff turnover and also capacity of staff to attend supervisions. So there are certainly ongoing uh, challenges, but I also believe cultural change is possible and that the foundations have been laid that we can continue to build on. And I guess this leads me to the final part of my presentation where I want to share some more recent developments, which is in response to incidents of racism, which is unfortunately a significant issue across the service where a lot of our staff unfortunately do experience this. Um, so I've been meeting with colleagues for some time, building with them a picture of their experiences of racism at work and the impact it has. Um, we've reflected on the limitations of current zero tolerance approaches, um, a reactive approach which doesn't really consider the underlying causes, attitudes or behaviours, um, to how restorative practices offer opportunities for dialogue, understanding and pathways for change with the aim of fostering and building meaningful relationships. The process has been incredibly humbling um, and the work I present represents that of many voices. Um, and based on the shared experiences of my colleagues and my knowledge of restorative practice, um, we've developed, uh, I guess, a, a new anti-racism strategy. I guess it's important to acknowledge that the strategy focuses only on patient to staff and patient to patient perpetrated racism and not where staff may have um, perpetrated racism. Um, I guess this is an issue that will need further thought and development, and I hope this piece of work is, I guess, one small step that could help lead to sort of developing these strategies more widely within the service. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so the strategy is built on four levels. Um, the first around prevention, which looks at building connections and understanding about staff and patients from different cultural backgrounds um, and actively promoting equality. So I guess we're looking at creating that in a number of ways. So we are looking at developing different cultural events where there's potential to celebrate differences um, and to appreciate and value the differences of um, people's identities. Um, we have a citizenship programme and respect days. Um, we're also looking at having ward reps so we can look at the um, issues on each of the wards um, and have an active ally group, which, as I mentioned earlier, was a group that I developed um, a couple of years ago and it's run twice so far with positive feedback, although further analysis is still needed. And I guess embedded within that programme are very much restorative principles. Um, and I guess running through each of these four levels here, um, would include effective statements, restorative questions and restorative circles. So using all these opportunities to think about difference, think about culture, celebrate that, and then also begin to challenge where racism does appear. So the second level is around disruption, and that's around developing safe and confident responses to those who hold and present racist attitudes. So that will include some staff training, um, looking at the use of restorative questions and effective statements, so racist behaviour is named and challenged, um, giving the potential for the person who's caused harm to experience, I guess, that discomfort of personal accountability as a route to change um, and reintegrating them through the restorative process. Um, we're also looking at developing anti-racism and active ally care pathway for our patients. So on admission, completing admission, uh, assessments of attitudes and behaviours around racism and developing individualised care plans to try and target behaviour, including restorative responses, the um, active ally group and participation in our cultural events. Um, and also working alongside the police, so where um, Incidents of racism have happened, they can be reported as a crime and responded uh, to as appropriately. Um, the third level is around promotion of disengagement, and this looks at opportunities for learning for individuals who present with both overt and also more subtle expressions of racism. 
So we're thinking about setting up um, a challenging racism group, which would look at naming racism, racist acts, targeting misinformed beliefs. It would very much be formulation driven um, and would look to develop individualized um, plans for our patients. Um, we would also look to review how those care pathways are developing in our sort of fortnightly discussion. So it's something that's always in the forefront of our mind and being discussed. Um, and using restorative co uh, conversations to allow for meaningful dialogue to support learning about and understanding by providing safe spaces to confront and address um, racism um, and help teaching respect for difference. Um, I guess another part of this would be around staff training, so looking at issues around microaggressions, unconscious biases, um, and thinking about compassionate responses to racism. And then I guess the fourth part of the strategy is around addressing the impact of racism. So making sure that support for staff and patients who are victims of and witnesses to racism is in place. Um, so that would include looking at our support processes, which I've recently reviewed with as part of this process with colleagues. Um, we have reflective uh, practice and patient and staff debriefs to look at incidents as they happen on the ward. Um, and we also have uh, restorative conferencing. Um, so yeah, and a number of uh, things in place to try and support those who've been harmed. So the strategy is very definitely in its early stages of development, and I'm sure will continue to be tweaked and refined as we go along. Um, I guess it's a process in which I'm learning a lot and continuing to learn as well. Um, the framework has just been agreed by the senior management team and I guess the next task is to get this written up into a working document with all the details of procedures fleshed out. Um, following this, there'll be a series of workshops and training events to ensure that the procedure is implemented. And then I plan to evaluate different elements of the strategy and assess what impact it's having for, for our staff and patients within the service. Um, so, yeah, that's everything from me so I will hand over to Finn now. Thank you for listening. Great, you can see me and hear me okay. Good. Um, I'm going to uh, talk a bit about uh, what it's like maybe to be a restorative practitioner in a uh, mental health setting, because that's what I do uh, in a full time role. Um, <clears throat> so, um, Gerard, obviously, you, most of you heard my introduction in terms of how I got into this, but maybe just to share some personal story that um, I uh, when I was working as a prison chaplain, I received an email that said, um, would anybody be interested to try and deliver a program that we were running in the prison? It's called um, Sycamore Tree. Uh, some of you may be familiar with it. Uh, it's a course that's used in prisons around the world, I believe, to um, develop conversations around restorative justice and victim awareness. And I was doing that course in the prison and I got this email saying, would anyone want to try it in a uh, psychiatric hospital in South East London? And I thought, wow, that sounds really interesting. And, it, uh, <laughs> and that got me to where I am now, that sort of curiosity about trying to do something different in a space that I didn't know anything about. And um, it was from that place that we began the journey at River House and we tested out this course called Sycamore Tree um, uh, at the hospital and, and that's how the work began in the hospital for us and um, <clears throat> we delivered four of these courses and learned a lot about it um, the key thing is I think it sort of unturned lots of stones and developed a lot of curiosity both amongst the patients and the staff about this idea of restorative justice and the fact that I was there present on the wards uh, in the community, almost you could say embodying restorative justice. In fact, <laughs> whenever I go into the wards, some of the patients say, hey, Mr. Restorative Justice, they actually don't call me by my name, they call me by, by what I do or maybe what I represent, which I think um, is both beautiful <laughs> 
but also uh, uh, somewhat sort of like, whoa, okay, so I really need to sort of make a difference in this area of restorative justice because that's what they're expecting from me. And it's from those roots where the work began. Um, so um, following years of work, and Gerard mentioned that, uh, you know, I, uh, I became the first full-time employed um, person in this post, which I think is beautiful, but also quite sad. <laughs> Um, I'm hoping that there'll be more like me very soon because we do, part of our work has been to develop ways to change the system. And one of those is that we've developed job descriptions that enable people um, to employ somebody like me in other trusts around the country. And part of my role is also developing sort of policies and processes um, that secure the work more firmly in the system and protocols. Um, and also, um, so that something wonderful happened, uh, yeah, it was last year, actually. Um, we have something here in the UK called the Quality Network, uh, which um, sort of measures standards of care in our forensic services around the country. And we've managed to finally get in there a restorative sort of standard that basically says the service has got to have a co-produced strategy to respond to the requests from victims, patients or carers to participate in restorative justice. So we're hoping that over the coming years, as more and more services are assessed about the care they provide, they will bump into restorative justice a bit more and actually begin to take it more serious. So um, my, my role also includes actually receiving the referrals for restorative justice interventions, following them up, doing the meetings um, with colleagues who have trained or sometimes on my own initially. Um, I work also engaging family and carers. Um, we heard that sadly a lot of the offences can be against uh, somebody known to the person and, and often maybe a family member. And so we are also working to respond restoratively to the needs of family and carers who are both harmed by the relative in hospital, but also services don't always respond to those needs very well. In fact, um, uh, what came out of that work is that we developed also a, a monthly circle space where family and carers can come and meet each other um, and it's not where they talk about the person who's in hospital, but they um, talk about their needs because sadly still so many of them feel isolated and stigmatized um, by what's happened to them and what's happened to their relative. So that space is a safe place. We hope that people can begin to talk about that and find others going through similar situations and um, um, sadly, that's just paused now as we reimagine what that might look like because not many people were coming. Um, so we're looking to hopefully pick that up. Um, part of my role is also pro promoting awareness, keeping the conversation alive, uh, running awareness sessions, um, using leaflets. And we have these wonderful things in our hospital called these digital screens on all the wards, which um, pump out information or activities or events. And so I have a few slides on there about the Victims Code and Restorative Justice, which, um, which keeps it uh, in people's minds. Um, my role is also trying to respond to actual incidents in the hospital between patients, as Gerard mentioned, but also maybe between patients and staff, and, and also um, trying to support wider access for victims in the community to access restorative justice because I don't feel that they're always given a fair uh, opportunity to access that. So I'm trying to do, we're trying to do something about that as well. And we're also um, part of my, a small part of my role as well is sort of feeding into and maintaining a network of people in the UK who are exploring restorative ways of working in mental health. And we've got some interest and we've got some um, momentum. I've got about 14 trusts or so engaged in that conversation. So I'm also involved in trying to 
connect on, on, on an international scale as well, once a month meet with a group exploring sort of restorative ways of working in health from the US and Canada and Australia and New Zealand. So that's um, also part of my work. And we're also uh, involved in seeking restorative ways to, to have anti-racist practice become more part of our everyday experience um, in the hospital. And for those who, who are receiving treatment and staff to try and repair some of the historic harms that have happened um, so no doubt this work has its challenges, uh, obviously I'm the only one, so working alone can sometimes be quite a challenge when I don't have a massive team to meet all the needs and respond to them. You know, something we've reflected on as well is we haven't had many staff patient referrals over the time and we think there's a whole host of reasons why that might be, but I think some of it is, I think it's quite hard for, for staff to maybe talk to patients about what's happened to them. And, for them to trust that process is going to be safe and that information might not be used in other ways. There's a real challenge about sometimes trying to fit into a medical model maybe that hasn't got space for restorative work or maybe doesn't trust it or, or, or maybe sees it as an easy option. Uh, there's a real challenge around sort of building relationships where people trust um, people, <laughs> um, you know, um, a lot of work has happened, I think, because of the skill involved in building relationships and getting people on board with a, a new idea or actually taking a risk or a chance to trust the restorative process. Another complexity or challenge in our work is uh, what is readiness? How do we determine or how do we together with the clinical team? Um, sort of understand this idea of being ready when 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 there's um, mental illness and capacity to be remorseful or show empathy when that's really complicated so it can be quite challenging and uh, funding i think if we had much more funding to develop a team and maybe respond and promote wider access maybe that would be a good thing so those are just some of the challenges uh, in the workplace so you can see my role is quite varied, quite broad, but also a big part of my work is the therapies program that Gerard talked about. And, uh, and we've developed a, a, a wonderful intervention called Kintsugi. You may see my background and think, gosh, what is that butterfly that's, <laughs> that looks like has given fins some wings? And that is one of the pieces created on this beautiful intervention that we developed. And it was out of our experience with sycamore tree because some of the patients would say, um, Finn, I get it. I get that I've done some harm and, you know, I get it that I maybe need to respond to people. But, do you know, what about what's happened to me? Do you know some of my story? And I've been a victim. And so we really found that it's important to hear that and find a way to respond to that. And Kintsugi, the Kintsugi course is our response. It's, um, it's based on this Japanese philosophy um, that nothing's ever truly broken, you know, and that actually... Um, they can be restored and, and uh, so over six weeks we, we, we give people a chance to make something from clay to then decorate it in whatever colours and then break it which is always a challenge and then put it back together with this golden glue uh, and um, it's fantastic and beautiful to watch a story unfold over that the six weeks and it's also a chance to explore some of the restorative themes around repair and harm and how that feels and I'm often reminded how beautiful it feels to repair something rather than just throw it away or think there's no life in it you may have had that experience and so often people go oh yeah it feels great to repair it so good and then there's an angle in there to think about how they might repair some of the relationships or things that have happened in their lives. So that's also quite a big part of my role. Um, so I would like to maybe end. I saw she was on the call. I don't know if she's on the call as well. I didn't realize you were gonna join us, Pauline, but I've used this wonderful quote from you because you've uh, received some of the service and support that I've been talking about. So I'm going to finish my talk now with a quote from Pauline that says, I'm so glad that I took the opportunity taking time to attend the carers group. 
which is what I spoke about before. It's given me insight about the work that you all do in restorative justice, which is greatly appreciated. It's been a pleasure working with you and the team. Restorative justice was one part of the jigsaw puzzle where listening and encouragement helped me to look at my role as a carer different, differently. No more shame, I was able to rise. The carers group was a place where I felt safe and in this space, I felt free to share my testimonies. And my hope, why I do this work, <laughs> this complex, sometimes deeply traumatic work, is that people would no longer experience that shame and that they'll be able to rise. So I hope that even if you're in this call now or you're watching this <laughs> webinar on replay, let's let's work to dissolve shame in a restorative way and help people rise again. Thank you for listening. I'm sure I hope to answer some questions now. Uh, I think it's back to Gerard now. Yeah, and um, thank you, Finn and and Sarah and James. Uh, um, I think we're we're all now together on the screen to um, to respond to the the uh, any questions that come up in the chat. But I I think perhaps just to to um, pull that together in a way, it feels as if what I'm really grateful that you've been able to share is in our in our niche world of restorative practice, there is actually the restorative universe. There's all of the issues that are are um, at play, um, training and awareness and and application that we are are having to grapple with. And and I think um, you know a term in in anti-racism is really important to have allyship. And I think that what we've found is that we have to foster in mental health um allyship uh, in order to be able to to land land this work um so perhaps picking up on some of the questions in the in the chat um and maybe uh, maria banks thank you for your uh, your comments about um cultural change and uh, uh, uh how that interfaces with the faculty and and the staff members so so I, th I think across the UK there will be a a, a range, but I, I think certainly in in the London region that actually the majority of of nursing staff will also be black or mixed black, as well as the majority of our patients. So what we what we find is that uh, there is still, and this is to do with our the societal structures that we are are also part of, is that there is an unequal distribution of, of ethnic members of staff across the professional groups, perhaps less so in medicine, but certainly in psychology is a real challenge of diversity within our, our staff our staff group. Um, and occupational therapy similarly is trying to, to address that. But what we find is that in terms of our coal-faced nursing staff is that actually that is also a, a majority of, of, um, of black, mixed black, uh, staff members along with our, our patient group. And so picking up on your second point about microaggressions in that context, sadly, we have microaggressions, of course, but we also deal with macro aggressions. And one of the really key issues that restorative practice has supported us within in our setting has been an organizational imperative to address anti-bullying and finding ways for for Finn as our practitioner to work with our lead for anti-bullying in order to embed restorative approaches to thinking about how we address um, a bullying and, and conflict on the unit. So that, that's a really good example of finding a way to help the organisation with the problem that it knows it has and wants to address and interweaving restorative thinking into that. And I, I think that was also really well illustrated in what Sarah was saying about uh, the anti-racism strategy that's being developed and weaving restorative thinking into that from, from the get-go. Um, I'm mindful of really not wanting to hog the microphone and very grateful for any contributions that um, our, our panelists this evening, this afternoon, evening for us, um, would want to, to chip in. So we'll 
We'll go to you, Finn, with a question from Mika or Micah asking, Finn, what was the reason for National Health Service to start with RJ practice with you? How did that begin? Um, because of Gerard, most probably. <laughs> I think if I'm understanding the question correctly, uh, is it is it about the RJ practice generally, or is it about my specific role, Mika? Maybe you could clarify. But um, and, I think and maybe that, Finna, Yeah, go on. It, no, so I was going to say that actually, the the remarkable contribution that you make and why uh, it has been so valuable is is what you said in your talk about being the the personification of a function of a role and mm. that the challenge for mental health practitioners is that this isn't part of our core role necessarily and so therefore we're constantly being pulled away to do other things and that would mean that the work gets lost and what became evident in our our, our setting was that in order for this work to really be held to be delivered in the diversity of ways that we need that we need dedicated resource and fortunately we had a service director who understood that and who was able to find some resource for us to be able to keep keep Finn and employ Finn in in his role so so yeah Finn that, that's what I, I was thinking is that hmm. the question had to do with why you know why take the step of getting you into this restorative practitioner role and really it, it's to keep it alive mm. because it needs dedicated resource in 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 our experience anyway I, I know other services don't don't yet have that in the same way um, mm. yeah <clears throat> I think that answer hopefully that answers your question Mika but if there's further questions and and I think you said the objectives and I think that the objectives is to sadly there are lots of incidents of harm particularly in forensic units and services because of the um, fluctuation of people's illnesses so um, I think the objective is to have a restorative response and not always a punitive one that wants to blame or hold people to account, but actually build trust and take responsibility for things that happen. So I think that's part of the objective is to do that and to change the way that we respond to harm, I think, and serious incidents. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe if, if I could just elaborate and, and riff off of what you were saying there, I think another objective from the, the get-go really is, is actually thinking more specifically about victim needs. Oh. So our services are incredibly well resourced. Um, our, our, our bed day costs are very high. Annual costs are considerable. So we're investing a lot in the repair or the recovery journey for someone who committed offence but actually people have been harmed get very little and it's great that actually they're beginning to be ethical questions raised within the forensic mental health community about whether we should be doing more for victims but what what we often found was that the the victim work was somehow abstract there wasn't a a, a, a sort of real appreciation of what the actual victim would have to say to the person who caused their harm and and one of our, our service users who was involved in the project his his comment was that doing sycamore tree program and meeting victims was that he said it brought a whole new reality that he'd been an inpatient for 20 years and had never met a victim in 20 years of rehabilitation and what we're trying to do is to break down that that barrier those institutional obstacles to real contact um and it, and restorative justice is the most astonishing vehicle for making that possible and also to recognize of course the ripple effect of offenses there's, there's never just one person being harmed it's all of their loved ones their carers the, the the people who care for them the 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 teacher who's 
children are deprived of them in a classroom because you know they've been harmed by an offence so so trying to address the community repair aspect as well of restorative interventions that we we just are really not very good at in forensic mental health settings thanks for addressing that Gerard. um I have a question on, on our end. Uh, so mental health work and restorative justice work are often individualized and sometimes that's necessary, but yet both often reveal social and systemic and structural realities that impact individuals. Uh, how does this relationship between individuals and systems show up in your work? Um, Sarah, can, can I invite you to respond? Okay, sorry, Sue, could you just repeat the question? The... Yeah, how does this relationship between individuals and much larger systems show up in the work that you do? Um, gosh, that's a very big question, isn't it? Um, I, I'm not sure where to start with that. Um, James, <laughs> Jack Raj, you want to? So, are you, sorry, are you wondering around around the the interaction between the two, the sort of individual nature of the work and the systems, one how they how they integrate or how they cross over, cross pollinate almost? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think I, I don't know. Just from my own experience, I think. Um, I'm sorry, I'm thinking it's just how it sort of how it integrates i think just they they're not they're not there's something about the two not uh just drawing on another webinar where they've talked about that that integration is just how they can butt up against each other i guess is where you can how they, they don't necessarily neatly fit together um but in terms of the influence i think i don't know one reflection on the practice here which maybe isn't quite getting to the question you're asking, and please do say if it's not, but it is around how this, the system has other pressures and demands and things it needs to do, to do. So when it comes down to the kind of individual nature of the practice is, is how how is that influenced? So just thinking about the timing of restorative justice work and when it's within a context. So for example, here in this hospital, um, there, are, there are walls around it, you know, and, and the movement within that hospital can be impacted on when there's harm between two people within the hospital. And the system is is, is keen to get that movement going again. Um, but obviously, then in thinking about how do we keep kind of true the north point of the the principles of restorative justice around the voluntary nature of it and the kind of time that might be required to think about readiness and repairing those two relationships whilst also kind of understanding and honoring the system needs as well so i i, I don't know if that talks to what you're asking but um i think yeah, that's a great example, sort of highlighting that uh, the individual need might be for more time, and yet the system puts pressure on um, coming to a certain deadline, or um, is that kind of what you're saying, James? But, you know, sometimes there's this pressure to, to solve things quickly. Yeah, and I, I think that's just, I mean, for me, just again, from my personal experience, that comes down to communicating, like, the, the process and understa understanding it, I guess, and, and stop and just stopping and taking a breath and thinking, what what are the pressures, what what needs doing? And, and also, I think I mentioned a little bit about it around the, the complementary nature of, of restorative justice is one option, isn't it? There might be other options in the hospital here. We've had mediation, which sort of staff have been really helpful in saying and patients in saying that mediation is a way of moving things along at maybe a quicker pace just to get to get back to living respectively together and restorative justice adds a bit more depth so it's a wonderful complement to existing practices where if we've got time and there's readiness we can sort of really get into some of the the impacts of harm um, and that can include the system as well of course because uh, often what you find is the question I, I love in restorative justice is what's been the most difficult thing and i'm always surprised by the fact it's not what you think it is when the person tells you what it is for them it's something different and that can be related to the system as well you know and and, and how the system responds to harm um so i can't really interwoven picture on that front from just from my experience in a very small corner of mental health hospitals and maybe if I could add to that, Erin, I think really deep question that um, 
that you've posed are really important. I think my it's so many layers to it, but one perspective I think is the 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 fact that so many of our patients will have experienced um, uh, disadvantage, social exclusion, having having uh, challenges that they see as being their context how they understand what it is that led to the circumstances that they found themselves in and which then resulted in harm to others. And what we are having to try to do is to think first about um, stepping stones towards being able to recognize harm in each other, in another person. And that's first attending to the sense of having been harmed um, themselves. So, um, you know, obviously the Shakespeare quote to more sinned against than sinning or you're being identified in a way with being a victim in some way of having been harmed themselves and creating that platform in order to make space for thinking about how that experience of harm impacted on someone else you know that that cliche about hurt people hurt hurt people so and in fact the Kintsugi course that Finn described is a real attempt to first attend to the sense of having been harmed, been traumatized. Um, and, and in that, we're also now starting to look at the importance of the concept of the invested practitioner in restorative practice and how to interpret that in, in our setting. So um, I'm not sure if that also relates to the sort of questions that uh, question that you, you had in mind. Absolutely, yeah. Just reminding the the folks that you're working with that you know they are survivors of systems of harm. Um, that that's sort of the starting point uh, to be able to understand and take accountability for having harmed others. Um, we all right. We did have a question here from uh, Resmin Shah. Um, the passion and enthusiasm for restorative work is so wonderfully displayed by all of you. Thank you. Um, saying, I'd like to thank Gerard for introducing me to restorative work. As a lone practitioner in Dubai, I've started to use some of the principles in supporting families to move forward, and it has been a very wholesome and rewarding way of working. Um, moving from working with adults to moving with children, um, do any of you have certain suggestions about using restorative principles to work with, with younger folks? I can certainly share from the work that I've developed around the restorative wards um, where we've looked at introducing restorative circles and trying to get that sense of restorative community. A lot of that work has been begun in schools. Um, so there is a lot of work out there which looks at exactly using restorative practice in schools. So yeah, definitely using restorative circles is a really great uh, place to get children together to think about harms. And you don't have to think about a particular harm that's happened. It can be a more generalised discussion just to get people to start to reflect more on the impact and, you know, on their own behaviour for future occurrences. So yeah, I think I think there's a lot of stuff out there. And I think, yeah, absolutely, it could be used um, and applied to working with children without a doubt yeah yeah i'd agree with that and um great to see you on the call rasmund will not see you but know you're you're with us and the the incredible work you do in in mental health services in, in dubai and just yeah what sarah was saying that there's so many parallels between whole school restorative approaches and introducing the work that 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 stepwise process of socializing into restorative thinking that happens in schools and um which sarah's project in particular illustrates i think is um uh, and i think loads of materials available as well depending on the the type of difficulty um that you're encountering and there there's actually also tremendous overlap between non-violent resistance and non-violent communication strategies which i think are profoundly restorative and um uh, and obviously working with with challenging behavior in in young people well i am um i'm keeping an eye on the comments and it doesn't look like at the moment we have further questions from the audience so I, uh, and we're coming up on our time. So I think I'll just have each of you, if you'd like to say any final closing thoughts, um, or there, is there anything you, you wanna make sure gets said before we wrap up? 
Gerard, want to start with you? Well, I'm going to ask Emily if we can go in reverse order of the, the talks we've heard and and um, ask Finn if you you have uh, any thoughts that you want to, to close with. Then you're muted. And there I was being all sentimental and you didn't even hear any of it. <laughs> I said, I'm going to, I'm going to push from the heart and be completely spontaneous in my response. And that response is, I want to be a practitioner that can honor the um, race and culture dynamics a bit more or pay a bit more attention to the race and culture dynamics in my restorative practice going forward, because I think I've missed something and I'm missing something and I need education. And I hope to be part of the solution in that, as well as most probably recognizing I'm a bit of a problem sometimes as well. <laughs> So, and, and I, I, I would love to see it more widely accessible and do something particularly for the victims who are so often under-resourced and overlooked in trying to access a restorative opportunity. Certainly here, that's the case here. Thank you for this space and this opportunity, it's wonderful. And I'll pass it on to Sarah, because she was there. Thank you, Finn. Um, so yeah, just I guess thank you for for listening. It's been great to have this space today. I think um, it's it's been you know it's been a, a privilege to be a part of this um, process of introducing restorative practice into the sort of forensic mental health services and sort of seeing how it how different it is across the different services. It's really inspiring to 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 work with 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 different colleagues with these experiences. And yeah, I think there's still so much more that we can benefit from in introducing restorative practice into our services so um yeah, yeah i i look forward also to continuing to learn and sort of build on the foundations of what i have and and hoping to create um yeah sort of get that sort of culture change further embedded within services so it becomes just a, a way of working rather than something that's a process that we have to sort of overthink sometimes so um but yeah a long way to go but i think we've also come an incredibly long way as well so yeah thank you thanks sarah uh, uh, yeah just to say i was saying before we did this call, feel like a bit of a visitor in this field and it's very early days so just thanks for listening to that that my early experience of it and just hope to carry on conversations generally about learning about working in this way um in 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 any place so uh, yeah welcome any any reaching out from other people would be nice to hear from people on how they find working restoratively that's, that's still a le massive learning curve for me but thank you for listening and a pleasure to be with colleagues today hmm. great uh, well thank you team for uh, for being um so um, contributing so richly this uh, this afternoon um I, I I think for for me maybe in conclusion I I think that what we'd hoped would be that this would be an opportunity to to shine some light in an area of restorative work that perhaps many practitioners don't get access to and where there might be you know the the, the institutional barriers to to thinking this is possible but also the way in which our our client groups are conceptualized so whether they be sarah's uh, patients with autism and intellectual disabilities or people with severe mental illnesses that in fact restorative work is possible there too if it's held in the in the right way and with the right uh, combinations of skills and that mental health practitioners can't do this work without restorative practitioners and vice versa and so we really hope that this webinar will be um sort of sending out a, a sort of message in a bottle for um people to engage and to make connections and to think about how to do this work in their area and if there's any way in which we can share information or 
resources with you. I think that uh, on the so website when the webinar is available to to view, that uh, our contact details will be uh, available, and we're very happy as well for the institute to mediate any kind of contact between us if there's anything that we can share or or support uh, with colleagues um, in other settings. So thank you so much, Erin. Absolutely. Well, I'm seeing a lot of comments of appreciation. So certainly what you all shared is planting some seeds today uh, for folks. And um, we deeply appreciate the very thought-provoking conversation. So thank you, Finn, Sarah, Jared, James, for sharing about your inspirational and trailblazing work. Um, before we totally sign off, I'll just give a quick announcement about our next webinar. You're invited to join us again um, on February 21st at 12 p.m. That's another Wednesday, um, 12 p.m. Eastern time, discussing everyday RJ, moving from rhetoric to repair and resilience in ourselves and our communities with guests Josh Bacon and Desiree Anderson, and host Des Moines Wesley. They will be sharing about their current projects and practice and engaging in dialogue about meaning making and about making it right in everyday settings. We hope that you'll join us again for that conversation. You are also encouraged to check out our website for our archive of webinars about restorative justice. Um, I always say from over the last 11 years, but I think now that we're in a new year, it's over the last 12 years. Uh, and to keep up to date about other events and resources of the Zare Institute, we always welcome your partnership and support in the work that we do and are grateful for your involvement. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day and see you next time. <laughs>